General housekeeping. So how this evening's going to look? I'm very so excited. Um, we're going to have we're going to hear from three amazing speakers um, to begin, and they're going to be speaking to different themes of extractivism, and they've all contributed to this chain reaction edition. Um, and then um, halfway through the session, we're going to I'm going to guide a bit of a um, a dreaming space, which will be an opportunity to go a bit deeper into to creatively feel into what it is that we dream of in of our utopia. And then there'll be a discussion space and breakout rooms where we can kind of debrief that practice a little bit. And then um, we'll come back together all together. And that will be a space for a Q&A session with our panelists in the in the last half an hour at around 830. Um, and then and then we'll just close with a final presentation from from Nat. So that's what today looks like. And yeah, we're really excited. As I said, Chain Reaction um, is published three times a year. It's it's Friends of the Earth Australia's national magazine, as I'm sure you all know, and it was founded in 1975. And it's an amazing voice for radical writers, speakers, thinkers to come together and share, share around topics that other media outlets might not choose to publish on. Um, and so with that thought, we decided that extractivism and post extractivism is a really important um, issue to be talking about right now on this continent. And Liz is going to give a bit of an um, update on what extractivism in Australia looks like at the moment. Yeah, looks like in the moment. But, you know, basically, it's this idea of extracting things, whether it's materials, whether it's ideas, whether it's um, data, there's so many ways of how we could define extractivism and thinking post extractivism is just a way of going, what does it mean to live beyond take, take, take? Um, yeah, that's basically it. If you haven't already, the Chain Reaction magazines, are, uh, they're being posted this week, so they should land in your mailbox very soon, but the online version has already dropped, so you can read all of the articles there. I think that's about it for the housekeeping uh, things. Zia, let me know if I've missed anything out. But um, without further ado, I might move on to our first wonderful speaker, who is Liz, Liz Downs. Um, and Liz Downs is a, a campaigner with the Rainforest Information Centre. Um, and she's written for this article. She's working on a, a fa fantastic report at the moment, looking at, at what green extractivism looks like in Australia. So, yeah, Liz, I'm really curious to hear from you around how Australia is expanding our green energy sector and what impacts this is having. So take it away, Liz. <laughs> OK, so Australia's mining extractivism footprint. So, um, yeah, I've just got two tasks to do in this, like my five minutes. Um, one is just to explain a bit what extractivism is and what green extractivism is. Um, and then the next is to move on to the Australian um, uh, role in that. So um, extractivism has a few different kind of, it's basically rooted in kind of Latin American um, social movements. And it's got a fairly long history there with, you know, academia as well. And, but basically here it's been, I'm just going to get rid of, you know, it's better. Um, here it's been um, defined by War and Want, which is a, a UK sort of based um, uh, amazing kind of grassroots <laughs> NGO as the high intensity export oriented extraction of common ecological goods rooted in colonialism and the notion that humans are separate from and superior to the rest of the living world. Um, so I also wanted in to define energy transition because that's what we're sort of working with for um, uh, this a pathway towards transformation of the global energy sector from fossil based systems of energy production and consumption to zero carbon systems, um, which we all pretty much know what that involves the whole zero carbon um, climate change, which is very important, of course, we have to reduce, we have to get rid of fossil fuels, but the way we do it is really important as well. And what, um, you know, increasing numbers of activists are talking about is the fact that um, this transition to net zero is really heavy on minerals and metals. 
um, and particularly those metals that we're now calling critical minerals and which Australia is calling critical minerals because it's going to be so important for saving us from climate change. But wait, um, are they? is it all about climate change or is it actually also about imperialism and militarisation? And there's a lot of that as well. Um, anyway, so that's critical minerals. Green extractivism is another term that's popped up and that is defined by a scholar here Theoria Francos as the subordination of human rights and ecosystems to endless extraction in the name of solving climate change. And here we go, um, also justifying assum the assumption that economic growth and climate mitigation can occur together, i.e. if we just have a, you know, more technologies and um, a kind of top-down solution and you know a lot of billionaires can get together and dream up new societies we will save ourselves from global warming. Green mining is also associated with positive images of high-tech industries, green jobs and climate-friendly extraction. And also we've got an idea of sacrifice zones, which I won't go too much, but the idea that to really solve the climate and ecological crisis, we need to move into a justice tr transition where we don't create new sacrifice zones, which are those places that to their extractors somehow don't count and therefore can be poisoned, drained, or otherwise destroyed for the supposed greater good of economic progress. And if you want to know more about these definitions and terms, read your, your edition of Chain Reaction when you get it. Um, okay. Lastly, and introduction quickly to the Australian section, we cannot mine our way to climate justice. Um, so there are lots of solidarity networks now that are coming forward and saying very,